we are live <clears throat> we are live welcome back again to the legal services of eastern michigan legal lounge where today we will be discussing elder law and covid I am Ashney Young, Education and Outreach Coordinator for Legal Services of Eastern Michigan, and one of my favorite people here with me is <laughs> Katie Stanley, <laughs> Education and Outreach Manager at Legal Services of Eastern Michigan. Ah, and we are going to welcome some very special people right now. They're going to pop up on your screen magically. It's beautiful. Ha! There's the first one. <laughs> There's a, this is my favorite part. I genuinely favorite. get very excited. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone. The first question that we have for you is, who are you? Um, what organization are you representing? And what is one of your superpowers? I know that was three questions, but we're going to call it one. Who are you? What organization are you representing? And what is one of your superpowers? Because you have them. And Katie's trying to decide like who to begin. Who I was going to gonna begin? say, Amir, you have the top <laughs> corner on my screen. Would you like to get us started? First, I'm going to say this is rather Brady Bunchish, right? <laughs> you know, the intro of the Brady Bunch is pretty cool. Uh, Attorney Amir Aboeda. Uh, I'm a solo practitioner in Genesee County uh, from Aboeda Law Firm. That's the firm name. Uh, uh, I, I primarily practice elder law and estate planning and probate. A little bit of probate as well um and the only power that i can think of which i think you guys inspired me to do it uh to, to say this while we were getting ready for this was making people feel good about themselves mm -hmm. i think that's my superpower is making feel people feel and it's free right um and it makes people feel really good you know i mean I, I, that goes without saying of course but uh i think that's my superpower so I'm going to go with that. I can attest to that. Amir does a lot of work with us as a cooperating attorney in our firm, and we're so grateful for him. And it definitely extends into how he treats clients. So we're really grateful for Amir for you being here today. Um, okay. Allison, if you want to unmute and tell us who you are and what your superpower is. Sure. And I just want to say thanks to you, Katie, and to Ashney for, for inviting us here today. And I agree that Amir does make people feel great. And that's a lovely <laughs> quality. Um, I'm Allison Herschel. I'm the director and managing attorney of the Michigan Elder Justice Initiative. We provide free legal services and advocacy for older adults and people with disabilities. Thanks. And what's your superpower, Allison? Oh, my superpower, I forgot. Um, well, mm -hmm. I think if I have a superpower, it's that I've been doing this for more than 35 years and I still get up every day and love it. So I think I have just staying power. And I also don't need very much sleep, which is a very valuable <laughs> superpower. Thanks. Yes, and Allison was my very first mentor as an attorney, and I still look up to her to this day. So we're really grateful that you're still doing this important work. Seth, oh, how about you? <laughs> well, my name is Seth Neblock. I am the elder law attorney for legal services of Eastern Michigan. I'm the in-house guy, uh, you know, for the uh, elder law section of our uh, organization. I, um, my superpower, I guess my superpower would probably be the ability to communicate concepts to people who are, are laymen. And I'm, I'm very, really good at um, making people understand legal terminology and documents and making sure that um, people know what they're signing and, 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 and understanding the concepts that I'm trying to advise them about. So communication, I guess. Mm hmm. Thank you, Seth. Mm -hmm. Valerie, how about you? We'd invite you to unmute and tell us what's your superpower and who you are. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Ashney, for asking me to be here today. Um, I am Valerie Kutzatwe, and I'm an attorney with Chalgen and Trip Law Offices. I practice primarily out of the Saginaw location, um, and I practice elder law, estate planning, and probate litigation. Um, and I think my superpower would have to be the fact that I can tie my shoes one-handed. What? <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah, that's my new favorite one. We've heard karaoke from judges. We've heard some really cool ones, but we may have to make you demonstrate that in yes. a re repeat episode. I agree. <laughs> I want to see that one in real life. Sure. <laughs> you you know, don't believe it. Uh, Ashley, what, what kind of questions are we asking today? Okay. So, I mean, so the first thing, right, doop, right off top. Um, what are we talking about or what are we referring to when we say elder law? What does that mean? Anybody? 
Okay, I'll start. Um, and then I'm sure everyone else is going to chime in as well. But um, elder law is, is it's not just one form of law. It's not like criminal defense. It's not like civil law. It's not like um, landlord tenant or anything like that. It's a, a plethora of things, really. Um, it goes anywhere from disability and special needs planning to long-term care planning to estate planning and settlement, uh, guardianship, conservatorship, elder abuse, probate, uh, anything uh, that usually works with people who are elderly, 65 and older, older typically, or who are disabled or special needs. And I think, can I can I add on to that? Um, of course. <laughs> thanks. Um, one of the things about elder law is that I think there's sort of a philosophy if you're an elder law attorney. We're not, although many elder law attorneys do deal with probate in estates and what happens to someone's belongings in a state after they die, what we really are focusing on is how do we give people the very best quality of life that they can mm. enjoy while they're still here and while they're still with us. So we look at issues like how do we get them access to health care and public benefits? How do we assure that they have stable housing? How do we assure that they get treated with dignity and that they have autonomy to be able to control their own, their own lives? And it's really about getting to know your client and figuring out what does that client want and how can I use the legal tools that I have to make to give that person the quality of life that they're describing they want. Jumping off of what Allison said, I think we're seeing a lot of um, emergent issues um, or emerging issues with elder law right now that maybe traditionally weren't considered part of elder law. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot lately is um, grandparents raising their grandchildren and what's involved with that. And that's not technically, you know, Medicaid, estate planning, probate litigation. That's a little bit different area, but it, but it directly affects some of our seniors um, and their quality of life. Wow, I am already just so impressed with this panel. Thank you all for sharing. I just, uh, I'm so excited you're all here. Okay, so our second question, we're gonna get a little bit more into the substantive feature. And I think this was one that Seth had volunteered to answer. So I'm going to put you on the hot seat, Seth. What is a power of attorney and are there different types? Power of attorneys are documents by which the person who is signing them grants authority to an agent in order that that agent can perform certain duties on that person's behalf. Um, mm -hmm. People often come to me to have a will created and and while they when they come to me, I ask them if they have powers of attorney and they oftentimes think, They'll respond a number of different ways. Uh, I don't think I need that. I don't. I don't need that yet. That's always the, the funniest mm. one because by the time you need it, you're not able to create the, the power of attorney. Um, mm. But I explained to them that, in my opinion, powers of attorney are considerably more important than a will. A will talks about basically who gets your stuff when you're gone, right? Mm. And I understand that's important, and people want to make sure those things are. are uh, taken care of. But powers of attorney can make a significant impact in the quality of their life and the their family's lives while they're still here, while they're alive. Power of attorney mm -hmm. can impact your life while you're still here. Um, if there is no power of attorney and something were to befall somebody like a stroke or some sort of uh, medical condition that incapacitates them, now their family's in a lurch. They're not going to be able to take care of them. They don't have the authority to step into their shoes and keep their financial affairs in order. And under Michigan law, they don't even have the authority to make medical decisions. Um, so, you know, the only option at that point for the, the family members or loved ones is to petition probate court to become a guardian or conservator, which is okay, but it's quite cumbersome. And, and, and the court's kind mm -hmm. of involved for the rest of that person's life. And if they had created those powers of attorney back when they were uh, feeling better, it would have avoided that whole necessity for their family. So when I put it in those terms, oftentimes clients get much more interested in, in what a power of attorney means and how, what it can do for them. Well, and Seth, you kind of already alluded to this a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily have to be active right now, right? There can be what's called no. a springing power of attorney or some of the, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the different sure. types? There are two kinds of basic kinds of power of attorneys here in Michigan. There's financial power of attorney and medical power of attorney. Now, medical power of attorneys are always what we call springing, which means they are not activated until the person who created the document is incapacitated. 
then we say those documents are activated and the agent they've chosen can now make medical decisions. With financial powers of attorney, there are two kinds, um, both springing and effective on execution, meaning they're, they're in force as soon as they're signed. Um, I generally try to encourage people to go ahead and get the ones effective on execution because you might be surprised how handy it could be to have a family member or a trusted person in your life that you can call and ask them to go to the bank or go handle some, some business for you because you're in Florida and you don't feel like coming home. Um, you know, and that way that person has that authority. They can go get money out and pay the electric bill and your house won't freeze and you can stay in Florida for another week or two and, you know, enjoy your life. So I, I, I you know, I, the other thing is a lot of people, they want to do this springing thing. And when I explore why they say they don't, they don't really have a lot of faith or trust in the person they're considering naming as their mm. agent. And I'm always kind of taken aback with that. And I asked them, if you don't, trust this person to have access to your bank accounts and your, your financial affairs now while you are you know, competent and aware and you can keep an eye on things. Why in the world would you trust that person to have that kind of access when you're incapacitated and not able to keep an eye on things? If you don't trust a person 100%, you should not make them your agent. So and I think it's, um, it's fortunate for those of us who have like more options on people to choose. I can only imagine what it would be like to be yeah. someone who had maybe has fewer options um, now, but you did do some foreshadowing, right? You mentioned, you said that a power of attorney is more important than a will, but you didn't say that a will wasn't important, right? So what is included, and this is for, you know, for anyone, um, but what is included in a valid will and why should I draft one? And in a, in along with the power of attorney, right? Are there different types of wills? I'll keep going, I guess, unless anybody else wants to jump in. Um, yes, uh, wills are very important <laughs> documents. They are like the basic mainstay, uh, you know, estate planning document. Essentially, what a will is, is an instruction book for probate. Um, it, it, it informs the probate court of your wishes, who you wanted to be in charge of your estate as personal representative or more commonly known as executor of your estate. It also lets the probate court know how you wanted your estate distributed. Now, a lot of people today, uh, avoiding probate is a, a pretty uh, important factor in their planning. And, and uh, when I explain to them that their will won't mean anything if there is probate, um, can be kind of a shocker to some people. Um, but there are lots of different reasons why, uh, you know, people need to create wills. Um, normally, it's you're going to have your option of naming who you want to be in charge of your estate, which is critical. You have to make a good decision on who's going to be overseeing and administrating the estate. Hopefully it's somebody fair-minded and gets along with everybody and, and is going to make good, rational, you know, sound decisions. And then the other thing is you get to lay out how it's distributed. How do you want your, uh, you know, earthly possessions to be spread around after you're gone? And um, that can be very important. And then, of course, it allows the court to oversight um, that process and make sure that things are done the way you want it. So uh, wills can do also a, a, a lot of other things. They can uh, suggest to the probate court who you would like as a successor guardian to your children, or if you mm -hmm. are the uh, guardian of an adult in, in, in probate court system, you can also suggest a successor guardian for them and the court will take that into consideration and give it a lot of weight. Uh, you can do quite a bit of things with a will um, that you might be surprised. So anybody else wants to jump in on that one, I'll, I'll uh, let that one go. I'd like to add that, you know, I often explain to my clients that a will is essentially a letter to the judge, right? So, you know, every will is going to go to probate court, whether you open a probate estate or not. And the will usually says, you know, more formally than this, but um, dear judge, I went to see my lawyer and get my affairs mm -hmm. in order. Um, I had hoped to avoid probate, but if it turns out that there's something that needs to be probated, this is what I would like to happen to it now. So it's essentially like a safety net or a, or a catch-all for folks um, in their estate planning process. And that, you know, we want to do a will even when we're doing, you know, non-probate transfers or um, trust administration or things like that. 
Well, and to that point, you guys kind of alluded to this already, but if say you pass away and you don't have a will, a lot of times these words are thrown around and people don't really, you know, what do they mean? What does it mean if you pass away without a will or intestate? And I know in law school, we learned kind of about Epic and all of that. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Seth, while you're on this great role? <laughs> sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, the legislature of Michigan has promulgated laws which speak to what happens if a person dies without having created a will. That is essentially the definition of intestate. It means you don't, you're not a testator, you have no will. Um, so normally, the, you know, the uh, surviving spouse gets the lion's share of any estate. And then, of course, any surviving children um, are also take a share and there's you know it's it's by monetary amounts um but basically usually on an average estate the the surviving spouse will take the lion's share and uh, if there is no surviving spouse then it will go to the surviving children and if one of them has predeceased leaving a, a grandchild behind it will pass down the line to that grandchild if somebody passes away with no spouse and no children then it goes up the line to the parents if they're around and if not then it goes out to the brothers and there's a whole system of, of uh, designation of who are the rightful um, heirs of a, uh, of, of a person who dies without a will. So, you know, a lot of times people come in and they get a will and they, and they will create a will that perfectly mirrors what would have happened if they didn't have a will. Um, other than the opportunity to name their uh, executor, the will doesn't really accomplish much, but as uh, Ms. Kurtz Otway des described it, there, it's still a good idea to have one uh, because you never know what could change in the future between the time you create the will and and the time you pass away. Ah, you came back around to us. You got a little um, choppy for a moment there, but you came back. I, I, <laughs> part of me wants to break down some of that lingo. Oh, my goodness. As someone who is not a lawyer, I was like, goodness, epic, <laughs> intestate. Intestate just means somebody who does not have a will when they pass away. I, I got that correctly, right? Okay, boom, and doop, pinned. Did anyone else want to add on to that? I, I do, I do. Um, so I don't think we can talk about wills unless we also talk about trust as well, okay? Now, trust, we're getting a little more uh, extensive in, in, our, in our video here, in our um, uh, showing here, but uh, I, I believe somebody asked, do we always need a will? And this is, uh, I believe, attorney Matt Seuss from, uh, I think he also works for legal services as well. I'm pretty familiar with Matt as well. So Matt, this one comes up, goes out to you. Uh, do you always need a will? Well, I think I would be doing everybody uh, a disservice or every other estate planning attorney in Michigan a disservice by saying, no, you don't always need a will. But it's the truth, right? Uh, wills are something that you are not necessary for somebody to have. Um, now that estate planning is kind of an evolving, um, uh, evolving topic nowadays. Uh, ever since the um, the creation of what's called beneficiary designations on any type of uh, assets, meaning bank accounts, uh, retirement IRAs, annuities, things like that, even real estate now, uh, placing beneficiaries by way of ladybird deed. Okay, so uh, wills are, in my opinion, kind of like a um, like a like a safety net, if you will. Okay, meaning if you don't get your affairs in order, just like Valerie said about ten minutes ago, if you don't have your affairs in order, you have your will to lean back on and fall back on and say, "Hey, I forgot to do everything while I was alive. I'm 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 dead now." I'm wherever I need to be after I die. And now, you know, we have to probate, we have to go through the probate process. But uh, I, it wills necessary? I don't think so. Uh, it depends on what your assets are like. Um, it, well, I guess it kind of depends on what your assets are. But um, and I just, we're not going to get too much into it. But a trust is another mechanism in which you can avoid probate court. Um, and also have the same experience of administration of your estate um, by way of, um, of you know, uh, without probate. So some people don't mind probate. Some people um, are, not big, are not big fans of the probate process, which is understandable. Sometimes it's a lengthier process, especially pre-COVID when you had to go to court for everything. 
Um, now it's a little bit easier because of COVID. Probably the only bright side about COVID is now that we can do things via Zoom and uh, e-filing and things like that. Now, Amir, I'm, this isn't one of our questions, so just so the audience knows, I have to put him on the spot. Amir, you mentioned a ladybird deed, and I love this story because it's named after Lyndon B. Johnson's wife is the first one that a ladybird deed was named after, right? Seth is standing shaking his head. Uh -oh. But Amir, he, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I think Seth Not knows even it better close. than I do. Yeah, I think Seth knows the story better than I do. I, well. actually, oh, I actually do know the story. There was a law professor in Florida who originally uh, thought up the concept of the ladybird deed. And he decided he wanted to demonstrate the concept to his class. So he came up with some hypothetical names to demonstrate, you know, the, the different players involved with a ladybird deed. And um, among the, the players involved was uh, he chose Ladybird Johnson to be one of the hypothetical mm -hmm. uh, remaindermen of a ladybird deed. And that just stuck. It never had anything to do with President Johnson. He never did it. Um, he doesn't need a ladybird deed. He never did. He was. <laughs> Very wealthy, and I'm sure he probably had a truck. Or who knows what? No, so it didn't have anything to do with uh, Lady Bird Johnson, it, but it, in a way, was named, after, named her. after her. Okay, so yeah. so before we move into Ash or uh, Allison's realm of complete expertise, do you want to tell us really quickly what an, a Lady Bird deed is, Seth? Uh, sure, a Lady Bird deed is what I call legal smoke and mirrors. It's kind of like <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you something, but I'm not yet. Um, essentially, a Lady Bird deed is. The, the legal term is an enhanced life estate. So basically, it's a way of naming essentially a beneficiary to real estate. Uh, but you retain all the authority of ownership, much like when you are name a beneficiary to your bank account, you can still go get all the money out or put more money in or close the account entirely. But if you die, then that money goes to the person you've named. So it is with a ladybird deed. You uh, name the person you want to or persons you want to receive your real estate after you're gone. But if you change your mind and decide you want to sell the house, you have all the authority of ownership to do that. You can mortgage it or lease it or anything else you choose to do right up to the point where you pass away. But if the house is still in your name when you pass away, then all that person has to do is go record your death certificate and the ownership transfers to the, the new owner uh, without any sort of probate or, or any other hiccups so to speak and, um, and i would like to you, kind of, we're getting chunks of like clearness from you and then chunks where i'm trying to read your lips and my lip reading skills aren't that great so i don't know if there's like a little tweak that you can give us to your microphone but i just thought you should know i, I don't know i I'm, i got a good wi-fi signal it appears and uh you know i'm uh, sitting right in front of my computer uh it's a it's a legal services computer, so you know. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. Kind of, no, did want to okay. tack on to something that you kind of touched on in that there are sometimes when probate has advantages, and you know a lot of the attorneys out there don't want to don't want people to know that because they're trying to sell trusts. But um, there are some situations where probate is actually the best solution. Um, a lot of times, if there's a lot of acrimony between family members, and uh, you know you need a certain amount of oversight. One of the advantages of, of the probate process is the court oversight. The court will be there looking over the executor's shoulder and making sure he or she, you know, handles things in a proper way. And another advantage of the probate process is the requirement of an inventory to be uh, provided. You know what, Seth, we can't air. hear you. So I think we're going to have to just move on to the next question because you're breaking up, but that's okay because we have the expert, wonderful oh, Allison you. Herschel here. And Allison, I'm so sorry, but we're going to tag you in probably for the next few because this is your area of expertise. Nice. Um, so this first question we have here and while we let Seth buffer a little bit, <laughs> oh. what what is the difference between assisted living and nursing home level care? And I mean, when we ask that, what are the differences in regulations or protections for those involved? Okay, that's a great question. And there actually are a lot of differences. Let's start with nursing homes. Nursing homes are the highest level of, of long-term care. And they're also by far the most regulated level of long-term care. So there's an extensive body of federal law that protects people who live in nursing homes and require nursing homes to meet certain standards, very detailed standards. Um, and there's also state law that regulates nursing homes. So, but assisted living is actually, it's not a legal term, it's more like a marketing term. And there are various kinds of assisted living facilities. 
There are some licensed li um, assisted living facilities in Michigan, and those would be called either adult foster care or homes for the aged. They are not regulated by the federal government at all. They're only regulated by state law and the regulations and requirements are much less stringent than for nursing homes. Another really important difference between, and oh, let me just say, in addition to adult foster care and, and homes for the age, which are licensed assisted living in Michigan, there are also many, many, many facilities and none of us know how many um, that are not licensed, but are providing long-term care to many individuals. The fact that a home isn't licensed even though I've been doing this for my whole career, I can walk into a place and I won't be able to tell if it's licensed or not. Both licensed and unlicensed facilities can be really good and they can also be really, really worrisome. Um, one last important uh, or a couple last important differences. Um, nursing homes do accept Medicaid and Medicare payment to pay for your room and board and your basic costs but assisted living facility does not, is not able to take Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement. So if people are paying room and board costs in those assisted living facilities, they're gonna have to be paying out of pocket. And the last thing I'll say, oh, okay. But I think I'm getting some feedback, I'm sorry. But the last thing that I'll say um, about nursing homes, are you hearing that feedback? I'm sorry, I hope that you're not. No, okay. The last thing I'll say about nursing homes is that there is a higher level of care, as I said at the beginning, and that means that you're, there are nurses there 24 hours a day. There are requirements for um, how often doctors have to come in, though it's not nearly as often as you might think. Um, and so you get more real medical care, whereas in assisted living, you're more likely to get supervision, but not as much medical care or not as sophisticated medical care as you might be able to get in a nursing home. So if a person is preparing to enter nursing home level care, what is a, di a divestment for Medicaid purposes and what should they consider? And can you break down that question? Because even though I asked it, I don't know that I actually understand it. And I think I'm not the best person actually to answer the divestment question, because I think that's a question for Amir, since he does a lot of Medicaid planning. Am I right, Amir? Anyone who wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, wow. I feel like you're giving me the throne, Allison. This is pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, I so I do a lot of Medicaid planning. And so m m what Allison mentioned is that uh, the uh, accepted, uh, accepted form of payment to a Medicaid facility, which in this case, she's alluding to a nursing home or a assisted living home who accepts what's called the My Choice Waiver Program. Um, each county in Michigan has a My Choice waiver program, I believe. Um, and our in Genesee County, Lapeer County, and Shiawassee County, the counties that I'm pretty familiar with, uh, it is managed by the Valley Area Agency on Aging. Um, and so, in order to accept Medicaid, um, one has to qualify for Medicaid. Uh, generally speaking, Medicaid is a welf welfare program, so there is um, restrictions as far as how much you can have as assets, but um, everyone's bright idea was, well, listen, we have a bunch of money here that we basically saved up our entire life, our life inheritance, basically our life savings. Um, and now I had a stroke or a TBI or anything like that, that I need to go to a long-term care facility indefinitely. Um, but I don't want to spend all my money. Okay. So, uh, I think sometime in the eighties and the late eighties, they changed this rule where before that pe uh, people who needed long-term care would just say, here, son, here, daughter, here, wife, here, you know, cousin, whoever would say, here's a check for all my life savings. Look, I have no more money left. Um, now give me Medicaid. Okay. And Medicaid will pay for substantially all or most of the uh, long-term care facility. And so I think sometime in the late eighties, I believe it was 88. Allison, you might need to fact check me on that one, but uh, I believe it was 88, 89, where they started initiating these divestment rules. So it stopped people from um, uh, just giving away all their money and saying, hey, look, uh, we have no more money left. Instead, they would uh, they would initiate or get, give penalties to those people who gave that money away to their kids or to their spouse or whatever it is to save all the money so they get free nursing home care. Now, how it works is, so I believe the divestment divisor as of 2021 is $9,560. So how it works basically is, hey, if you have $100,000, 
that you have in your life savings, not including a house or a car, because for Medicaid, those don't count as an asset. If you have $100,000 and you um, give away, if we give away $100,000, you're going to be penalized about 10 and a half months. Okay. So you take that $100,000, you divide it by the nine, $9,560, and that number is about 10.5. Okay. So what Medicaid does is says, hey, you just gave away $100,000. You can't obtain my Medicaid, your, the Medicaid benefits for 10 and a half months. Right. So for those 10 and a half months, Medicaid is not going to pay for the long-term care. Instead, you'd either have to give get the money back, uh, which you gifted, which would be the full one hundred thousand. Not even if it was nine hundred ninety-nine thousand, or no, I'm sorry, ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. Even if you give that back, it's still not enough. They're still going to hit you with a, a divestment. Or if you pay privately at that facility for that ten and a half months, in which that time you would serve your divestment penalty, and um, at that point, your Medicaid eligibility and your benefits will be in full force and effect. So the most important lesson I can give to everybody out there, and mind you, this is not me giving out legal advice. I just want to make a, uh, an asterisk on that, um, is if you think you need long-term care, stop what you're doing. Don't think you're smarter than the system. Don't give away your assets and think that you're going to keep your whole life savings when you, when Medicaid is going to spend probably hundreds of thousands of dollars on your care, right? They, People have already tried it, okay? And, and they, that's why they make these penalty rules and these divestment rules for that situation. So before you do anything crazy, I suggest you talk to probably one one of the four attorneys or the five attorneys on, and, on the panel here before you make any drastic moves. <laughs> so Medicaid is technically considered a welfare, a welfare program. You have mm -hmm. to qualify for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. If you have certain assets and you spend those assets and you're looking for nursing home level care or not, right? A divestment is a penalty that will prevent you from being able to access Medicaid because basically they're like, yo, you have money. You can't spend all of your money and then expect that we're going to pay for Medicaid. You have money. So you go get that money back in order for us to pay for it, or you're going to have to pay for those services yourself. Did I, did I catch you, you that? I got it. And then you, you, you were like going and then you hit one speed bump and then now I have to like, give me the bump because I need that. Cause if I'm confused, somebody else is confused. <laughs> so basically you said, well, Hey, you can't spend all your money. No, you can spend all your money if it was for legitimate reasons. Right? So for instance, um, you know, you can, it's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. Where they have, Medicaid has a problem with is, or the Department of Health and Human Services who control the Medicaid in, in Michigan, what they have a problem with is if you gift it away, right? So meaning you don't spend it on yourself, you give it to a kid, a son, daughter, cousin, you know, aunt, uncle, whatever it may be. Now, the only exception to that rule is if, I mean, there's actually a couple exceptions. Two of the main ones that I use primarily is you can give away your assets, all of your assets to a special needs child. Okay. And there not be a divestment. Okay. That's one of the rules I use actually more, uh, you know, more, more often than not. And then the other one is we talk about spousal impoverishment laws that we have in the state of Michigan. So just because your husband and wife has to go to a nursing home or a long-term care facility doesn't mean you have to go broke in the meantime, right? So this is actually my favorite practice part about practicing elder law and Medicaid planning is when the families come, the, the husband's in a nursing home and the wife comes and she's crying and she's she's shaking and she's just having the worst time in her life right now. The best, most um, the best thing I can do as an attorney, the most gratifying practice uh, kind of client I have is the the wife in this situation she's coming to me crying she's like come here i'm 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 done right i'm gonna have no more money we have to get on welfare welfare to get the nursing home paid and i look at her and i'm just like look at how you are right now and then i want you to remember how you are right now and then remember yourself when we're done with this case okay and then when we're done with the case when we're keeping the money and everything like that she she they 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 love it i mean i just basically save their livelihood in a way right so um the the rules we can get into uh i don't know if we, if we have enough time tonight to get into the rules they're pretty extensive but for now as far as divestment i think everybody should know if you have a you know husband wife 
mom, dad, and uncle, son, daughter that need a nursing home, don't think you're smarter than the system. Just stop for a second and don't do anything crazy with the assets. Talk to somebody who's, you know, very familiar with uh, the investment laws in the state of Michigan. Thank you Hi. so much, Amir. Oh, of course, Allison, jump uh, in. One really quick sentence just to the end that the, the whole purpose of this, as Ashney and Amir said, is to penalize people who give away money so that they can qualify for Medicaid. But sometimes the state is overzealous and they'll impose a penalty on someone who wasn't trying to qualify for Medicaid, but was just trying to help out a grandchild with college tuition or um, make a charitable contribution. So my only um, other sort of upbeat thing is if you're someone who has a divestment penalty and you really weren't trying to qualify for Medicaid, but they are spending money in a way that you don't have, we might be able to help you and we can appeal that. Thank you so much, Allison, Amir. That was a great explanation. And I, I think before we shift gears a little bit back to Allison's expertise, I want to ask, there are certain folks that are probably more vulnerable and more isolated than others. And seniors are one of those groups of folks. And we see in our practice, Allison, when I worked with you, some of the people that would uncover elder abuse were not family or friends. They were the teller at the bank who saw suspicious activity or an in-home care aid. So if you're one of these people that might have interaction with this vulnerable population, what are some indications or signs that you can look for of elder abuse or exploitation? I'm happy to cover those quickly. And I know we have lots of other questions too. But the first thing I'll say is, if you're one of those people, trust your gut. Because a lot of times, um, especially those of us who work with an older population, our antenna goes up and we're usually right. So trust your gut if something seems off. But the kinds of things might seem that might seem off is obviously if someone is showing signs of physical abuse, bruising that can't be explained or something like that. If the person is suddenly being isolated from other individuals who have always been important to that person. If, if unusual activity is happening on their bank account, for example, if they have a new best friend and all of a sudden they're spending all their time with that new best friend and ignoring the people who've been important for decades. Um, there are many, many signs, but I think with all of these, the most important thing is if you feel suspicious, say something. If you see something, say something. And you might just start with the individual himself or herself and say, look, I'm really concerned. It seems peculiar to me that you don't want to spend time with your kids when they've always been so important to you. Or, um, you know, I'm just really worried you've never not been able to pay your bills promptly before. How come I'm seeing these shut off no notices? What's happening to your income? And I, and I think just starting that conversation with the person is often um, the very best place to start and to tell the person, look, this happens to lots of people. It can happen to anyone. Let me help you. Let me figure out there are resources out there that can help get you out of a mess if you're in one. Don't be embarrassed. Reach for help now and we can, we can um, come up with some solutions. Yeah, and this is a great point at which for all of our viewers watching to indicate that we do have specialized grants for crime victim advocates. That was my previous position with Allison. So if you're someone that's experiencing this or you know someone that is and you're in our service area, please give us a call. Um, and also, if you're a senior in Genesee, Shiawassee or Lapeer County, give Seth a call because he is our advocate for those three counties. Um, Allison, so if there is an issue of elder abuse, what who should they contact first? And then what's available to the victim insofar as compensation or resources? Okay, so there are lots of different um, uh, entities and organizations that will help someone who, who has been abused, neglected, or exploited. The first one that people think of is adult protective services. I think people are more familiar with child protective services, but there's also adult protective services which performs the same function for vulnerable adults, not just for older adults, but any vulnerable adult. So um, that, that's, there's one statewide number to call for APS. I wish I had it with me right now, but I don't actually. Um, and that's a good place to start. As you mentioned, Katie, we have a network of lawyers across the state who provide free legal services to people 55 and older who are the victims of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. That program is called the Crime Victims Legal Assistance Program but Project, but that's misleading because you don't have to have reported this to the police the person who is exploiting or neglecting or abusing you doesn't have to have ever been charged or, or convicted of anything. If you're someone 55 or older and you need help with abuse, neglect, or exploitation, 
one of our lawyers might well be able to help you for free. So um, that's always a good place to start because then we can look at all the resources that exist. We don't expect every client to know all the uh, resources out there, but we know those resources and we can help you figure out if there's a legal solution or if there's another solution that might be able to address the problem and make you safe again. And before I tag my partner in crime, good trouble here, Ashney, back in, I did was able to look up the DHS Adult Protective Services number. If you want to report adult abuse, you can call 855-444-3911. And I'm sure one of our incredible support backstage staff will put that in the chat for us. And then really quickly, before we go into the next set of questions for the amazing Valerie around guardianships, what... Um, for a crime victim compensation application, I just want people to know that's out there because when I was in this practice area, that was one thing that most people did not know about. Um, but the distinction there, Allison, what is the trip on that, that there has to be present for a crime victim compensation application? Yes, and I always forget the second part of your question, so thanks for reminding me. <laughs> um, I get so excited about the first part, I don't get to the second part. Um, there is a crime victims compensation fund. I will just say the crime has to be convic committed in Michigan. Um, there has to be physical injury. Um, the person who wants the compensation can't have been involved any, in, in any way in the crime that was committed. And there are various other restrictions. The compensation could be up to $25,000, I believe, but um, it's only to reimburse for certain expenses that wouldn't be reimbursed any other way. So although there is this fund and we're always glad to look at it for you and see if there's a way you can make a claim, um, oh, and it's important, you have to have reported this this um, crime to the police very promptly. We'll look for you if you can collect it. Unfortunately, that the compensation um, fund has a lot of requirements and may not be able to help a person, even if they're a victim of crime. Thanks. Thank you so much, Allison. Ashley, you want to tag in for this next set of questions? Let's do it. Okay, so... What kinds of restrictions on visitation have you seen during the pandemic and how can concerned individuals determine if these restrictions are lawful? I, I know we were gonna turn to Valerie. I don't know, Valerie, is that a question you wanted me to answer or did you wanna take a stab at that? I think that's you, Allison. Okay, okay, uh, happy to do that. I, I, I will say one of the most harrowing and heartbreaking things during the entire pandemic is how isolated nursing home residents have been and you know, for many, many, many months, they were locked in their rooms. They weren't even allowed to, to associate with other residents, let alone see family and friends for the most part. Thank goodness that is now changing. So um, now if, uh, if you have a family member or loved one in a nursing home and they are considered to be at the end of life, they don't have to be right at the very end of life, but if, they, if you know, a determination has been made that they're close to the end of life, or if they need special help, like help with meals, or they're particularly depressed and losing weight because they can't see family, then you can see them anytime. You can see them even if they have COVID, you can see them at, without any restriction. And if it's not someone who is at the end of life or has special needs, then you can still see people indoors and there are some restrictions and limitations on that. The policy is complicated, so I won't get into it, but I will say, I'm very proud that my office houses the Michigan Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. And ombudsmen are incredible advocates for people who live in nursing homes, adult foster care, and homes for the aged. The number one issue we deal with now is helping residents get the visitors that they want in those facilities. So that's a number I do have. And I'd like to just mention that quickly, because if you are not able to see someone you care about in a nursing home, we will help you and we will be thrilled to do it. You should call 866 485-9393, A lot of nursing homes and other facilities are saying now that you still can't get in to see people or you can only see people with in very, very restricted times. That's just not right. The law and policy have changed or the policy has changed on this and we wanna be able to help. Thanks. 866-485-9393. That could be a song. Okay, so let's try this right. Guardianship, conservators, Valerie, is that more your lane? Ah, That's my lane for sure. <laughs> okay, I got one for you then. What is a guardianship? What is a conservator? What are their roles in an elder law case? So I guess technically I had three. 
Okay, so like Allison, I might forget the last one, so you might have to circle me back around. Um, but a guardian is a person who's going to make um, medical and placement decisions for another person. So in the elder law arena, um, you know, we have a couple of different types of guardianships. We have a guardianship for a person who the law deems is legally incapacitated. And then we have a guardianship for a person who... Um, the law deems to have a developmental disability. So when those people need a guardian, it's because they can't make or communicate informed decisions um, for themselves and they need someone else to do them. And um, kind of spinning off of what Seth talked about earlier, this can happen when folks haven't um, prepared their estate planning documents in advance. So much like a, um, patient advocate designation or a power of attorney for health care um, would act, a guardian would act in a similar fashion. Um, a conservator, however, would be similar to an agent under a durable power of attorney. So a conservator is going to um, manage the person's um, money, finances, you know, file their tax returns, things like that. Um, so those are the differences between a, a guardianship and a conservatorship. And folks might need a guardian or a conservator if they haven't done estate planning in advance, if they haven't issued, um, you know, a durable power of attorney for, for their financial matters, or if they haven't executed a patient advocate designation um, for their health care decisions. Um, but sometimes um, folks have also already executed those documents, but maybe the individual they named is not acting um, appropriately. And so, you know, an interested person can petition the probate court and, and say, you know, even though this uh, individual already has a power of attorney or a pa patient advocate in place, that individual is not acting um, in the person's best interest. So then they would need a guardian and conservator at that point. Okay, so what's, what's the difference between a power of attorney and a guardianship? So a power of attorney is primarily private. That's how I explain it to my, my clients. So you choose, if I'm going to um, execute a power of attorney, I might name Seth as my agent under that power of attorney. And I make that decision and it's private and it doesn't go to the, the probate court um, and it doesn't become a public record. Um, and I don't let the judge choose. I choose for myself. And that could be, you know, either a power of attorney for financial matters, or that could be a power of attorney for healthcare matters, also known as a patient advocate. What is, what is, um, can, quick, can, I, can I add something to that? Oh, yeah, because I was going to ask. So in some powers of attorney, like the powers of attorney that I pr produce um, for my clients, there's actually a designation in the powers of attorney that say, if I ever do need a guardian, I want to nominate my agent under this power of attorney so that if anything ever um, transpires or if, you know, based on the priority of whom they, the court would appoint as a guardian, because there is a priority. Okay. Uh, and one of those top priorities is the person whom the ward or the potential ward nominates. Okay. And so, Obviously, if the ward is not capable of nominating a, a guardian anymore, uh, and if they did their estate planning at a, a younger age when they were able to do their estate planning with powers of attorney, they would be able to look at that power of attorney and say, hey, this person wanted this agent to be the power of attorney, not Joe Schmo down the street that's now petitioning for their guardianship. Seth brings up a good point because sometimes um, – you know, outsiders don't know that someone has, um, you know, executed an estate plan. So it, it could be the case that, you know, I determine that Seth needs a guardian and I don't know that he's already um, issued a power of attorney or a patient advocate designation. And, and as an interested person in Seth's um, life, I might petition the court. Uh -huh. 
and say uh, he doesn't have um, capacity and he needs a guardian and conservator. And then maybe Amir is his nominated agent under those documents. And at that time, Amir could come in and say, well, if he does need one, um, I'm nominated. And um, if they, if we don't need a, a guardian conservator, I'm the agent. And I, I think we always want to make sure that um, a, a person doesn't have a get a guardian if there is a less restrictive alternative, because even though guardianship is really important to help people who don't have anyone else to act for them and can act for themselves, um, it does strip people of their rights to mm -hmm. make decisions for themselves. So if there's another way, if we can preserve someone's autonomy by doing something less restrictive, a power of attorney um, or um, an advanced directive for healthcare decision making or any of a variety of other strategies, then we would always want to do that to make sure that we're not taking rights away from people when we don't have to. How does guardianship like to relate? Go ahead, sir. If I can, without uh, being too choppy, I would like to say that Amir or Valerie would both make wonderful guardians for me. And uh, if you guys are willing. <laughs> um, are you nominating us? Right you're putting now? us on uh, notice, Seth. <laughs> so, you, you know, there are... A, in, in order, but, then. <laughs> there are some less restrictive alternatives in, in within the probate process as well. You can request that the court uh, grant guardianship uh, for what they call plenary powers, which means they have the full authority, or you can also restrict those authorities to just for certain things, um, which is, I think, a better way because then it still retains a certain amount of autonomy for the, um, for the ward. Um, so we, I'm seeing a lot more of that happening in the probate court uh, these days uh, that they're, you know, actually kind of just trying to limit this authority because it's a drastic decision. Um, you're, you're essentially determining this person no longer is able to make decisions for themselves. And, uh, you know, this other person is going to be making them for them. One of the things that people often get confused about powers of attorney is they think that if they sign this power of attorney now, they no longer have the authority to do things for their own self. And I, I'm amazed at how many people come to me with that concern. I, you know, when I broached the topic of power of attorney, oh, I don't want to do that. I can still do my own stuff. Yes, you can. And we hope you do. And please continue to do so. But if the day ever comes when you can't, now this document's in place and your family doesn't have to go through the cost because there is a significant cost. There's $175 for a guardianship, same fee for a um, conservatorship. And then, you know, the court essentially will be involved in, in that wards affairs for the rest of their life uh, or the rest of the guardianship anyhow and uh, you know a lot of folks would like to avoid uh, that court involvement so that's why the planning and the powers of attorney becomes so critical because they're in place and created while the person has capacity and knows what they're doing and then when the day comes that they're needed they're there and and, and it just makes things so much easier on everybody um tag on to that really quick tag on to that right my mind went a few places i don't want to drag us on too long i wonder what that looks like in cases of individuals who um maybe don't have the the mental capacity to ever have established a power of attorney i, I imagine that would be a different journey random pnping -ping. but um i wonder also how guardianship relates to trust if i'm someone's guardian, does that mean that I, I saw a mere smile? Does that mean that I'm also the keeper of their trust or estate if they have one of those? I know that was a spring of question, but I just had to ask. I, my, I was going to say Valerie needs to answer this one. <laughs> so generally, generally speaking, the, you know, the guardian is not going to have access to any of the, um, you know, financial, uh, you know, to the, any of the financials for the ward, the person who has the guardian. So, you know, with the minor exception that sometimes if there are no assets, a guardian may become the payee of social security proceeds, things like that. But generally speaking, if someone has assets, um, they're going to need a conservator to manage those assets. Um, and sometimes we can petition the court to allow the conservator um, to act as a trustee if there if there's not a backup trustee. Um, but you know, the, I would say those are rare occasions. Usually, if there's a trust in place, there's already a trustee named to manage those assets in the event of the person's incapacity. 
Now, in that same vein, since we're talking about guardianships, and I saw Allison's eyes perk up a little bit around this, do you, say you're under a guardianship, are there limits to that authority or can you challenge it? Go ahead, Valerie. Did you want to answer that first? I can always chime in later. Sure. Um, yeah, so the guardian's powers are going to be limited by um, what the court sets at, at, at the hearing. And so the laws are designed, um, as we discussed a little bit earlier, um, in such a fashion that we want the guardianship to be as limited as possible and we want to ensure the person um, has the most autonomy as possible. So, um, and, and, and honestly, you know, that's kind of the goal with um, powers of attorney as well. But, you know, how that shakes out in reality is not always how it's designed um, on paper. Um, so, you know, if it becomes, um, if there becomes an issue with the guardianship and the ward, and, and when we say ward, we, we mean the person who has the guardian. If that person is unhappy or, or um, thinks that there should be a change in the guardianship, that person has the right to petition the court for a change in the guardianship. Um, and also, in most cases, interested persons, you know, the law says any person interested in the welfare uh, of the guardian or of the ward can also um, challenge the guardianship, file a petition to modify, to terminate, that sort of thing. So I'll say there are two things that are unfortunate about the way guardianship actually happens in this state. First of all, if a petition is filed, it's almost certainly going to be granted. If you look at the statistics, it's shocking what a small percentage of petitions aren't granted. So that's why we prefer to use less restrictive alternatives without ever getting to the guardianship. But the second thing is that if a guardianship is going to happen, the a court is supposed to limit it as much as possible, but it's just easier for the court to give a full powers to someone else so that um, the person who's appointed guardian has the right to make all decisions for the person. Well, if even if that happens to someone, it doesn't mean it has to be true forever. And that's why you can do a petition to modify, um, maybe turn a full guardianship into a limited one or a petition to terminate, just end that guardianship. Often these things happen when somebody's in the hospital, it's on their worst day, they're not able to make decisions because none of us would be able to make decisions on that day. They get a guardian and then they never get out from under it and that's not right. So one of the things that those lawyers across the state that I was mentioning, um, the one where the program that Katie was uh, in um, when she started her legal career, one of the things we love to do is go to court to modify or terminate guardianships mm -hmm. for people who really are able to take more control of their lives. We want people to have that autonomy if they're able to handle it. Also, also if also I may. Too, is, um, APS will also intervene uh, when necessary as well. Um, on, on, number of, on a number of occasions in Genesee County, Lapeer County, Tuscola County, I've actually uh, assisted uh, by representation of Adult Protective Services, DHHS Adult Protective Services, intervene in situations like this. Modify, um, I don't think we've ever had to terminate uh, in that sense, but there is elder abuse cases where there has been some abuse and a change of guardianship is necessary. And uh, unfortunately the ward isn't able to speak for himself or herself. So DHHS would be able to intervene as an interested party um, to, to modify that. And so uh, APS does a, 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 an amazing job for, and they, they truly do advocate for their, their people um, and for the abused elders. There's also um, a little safeguard built right into the statutes for guardianships as well. Um, and that is that the, um, the court is required by law to send a person out periodically to investigate the status of mm -hmm. the guardianship. So in most cases, the, the first review of that guardianship occurs um, one year after the guardian was appointed and then every three years thereafter. Um, and, you know, when the person goes out to investigate the status of the guardianship, some of the things that they're supposed to check on is make sure that the person still needs a, a guardian, um, make sure the guardian's still willing to act. Sometimes people accept that um, obligation or that authority having no idea what's going to be involved. Um, and those are kind of like some free bites at the apple, you know, for review, if you will, that are already built right into the statute. 
Right, and you don't have to, Valerie's of course, write about the visitors, but you don't have to wait for a visitor to flag that you don't need a guardian. You can even just write a letter to the court and say, I don't think I need a guardian anymore, or I want a different guardian, or I'm really, I've, I've recovered substantially, and, and I, I don't think I need uh, someone else to control every aspect of my life. And then the court will hold a hearing on that. Within 28 court, days. <laughs> and the court will also appoint an attorney for you, um, mm -hmm. you know, when that happens. And if you can't afford the attorney, the court will pay for it for the attorney for you. And as I said, the attorneys in our program love doing this and mm -hmm. we're always free. In, in our county, in Genesee County, I frequently get appointed as a guardian ad litem, which is that's mm -hmm. the person who gets appointed to um, review the guardianship. So when I get appointed as a guardian litem, oftentimes um, they, I will do my investigation. I'll go visit the person if COVID um, uh, accepts that I visit the person. If not, I'll at least be able to Zoom call them um, and then check out their surroundings, right? Check out where they're living. Make sure there's food in the fridge. I know it's really kind of embarrassing to ask that question to people, but you know, I make them open the fridge in front of me in, in the Zoom hearings and say, hey, is there enough? Do they have a bed? Do they have a you know, clean clothes. Do that, and so these are things that um, the court initiates, which I think, in my opinion, Genesee County is one of the the pioneers of of, of helping and preventing elder abuse and guardianships. Um, to help, you know, if there's any red flags, we'll say something. Uh, and and that's uh, I, if it's not me, usually it's a, a social worker named Tony Cerny that she's the predominant uh, guardian ad litem that does a lot of these reviews. She's excellent. She's the one who trained me, matter of fact. Um, so I think Genesee County is great. Uh, Lapeer County does a great job as well. Uh, most of all the other counties do an excellent job. And in addition to that, um, to become a guardian too, I don't know what they do in Saginaw County, Valerie, but in Genesee County, uh, which I, I didn't, wasn't aware that every county didn't do this, but they make the potential guardians do background checks as well. So I, I'm, I think that's becoming a norm across the state now. I know maybe five years back it wasn't a norm. So they're doing everything they can. The courts are doing now everything they can to do to prevent, you know, bad things from happening in the future. Katie, do I have time to say one more thing about this? I was Great. just, yes, go ahead, of course. Well, one thing that people might have heard about is starting two years ago, the Attorney General, Dana Nessel, and the Supreme Court started an elder abuse task force and the issues that, and they did a listening tour all over the state and the issues that they heard about over and over again were problems people were having in, with guardianships and conservatorships where they thought that they weren't being well served and well protected by that system and that the good laws we have weren't always um, the, the way things actually turned out in reality. So um, that task force that was created by the attorney general has been working incredibly hard. I'm, I'm privileged to be a part of it. And any day now, with really within the next, I don't know, very few days, maybe it would even happen today, a number of pieces of legislation will be introduced to make that those protections even stronger. And yeah, we're really, really excited. The issues that we've been seeing with guardianship and conservatorship over many years are going to be substantially addressed by this proposed legislation, and we hope it passes. So, ah, that is so amazing. Thank you so much, Allison, for sharing that with us. I just, there's so much knowledge and great energy on this panel that I wish we could stay all night with you all, but we're coming to the end of our time. Oh no. But we have some audience questions. We would love to get a few audience questions in before we let you all go. We promised we'd let you go promptly. So for the first one, can the panel provide some guidance regarding how an elderly person can transition from their own home into assisted living or nursing home setting? And that's free for any of you. So I, I don't know exactly what the issues were that the person asking the question um, was thinking about, but um, the most important thing I think is to pick the right setting and the right facility. If you're someone, first of all, and this, I can't believe we got through this whole thing and I haven't talked about this yet, but I want people to know that aside from the um, kind of facilities, assisted living and nursing homes, there's also a whole array of home and community-based services. And if you're eligible for Medicaid in the nursing home, you might well be eligible for these services in the community too. And um, you might not need to transition to an assisted living or nursing home setting if you could get the help you needed right in your own home. Many, many, many of our clients do. And it's a lovely, lovely thing when people are able to age in place, stay right where they are. 
So that's the first thing. It's important to explore those other options. Our office is always delighted to, um, and, and I'm sure Katie's office is as well, um, to help you um, figure out, is there something you can do to help you stay home? If you wanna to go to a, a facility, then you need to figure out what's the right level of care and what services do I need? Can I pay for that care? And which of those facilities um, offers high quality care? I think a good place to start is the ombudsman whom I mentioned before, and we shared that number before. We can help kind of talk you through this as can many elder law attorneys to try and figure out what's the very best place and what do I need to think about when I'm choosing that place. Thank you so much, Allison. And we probably have time just for one more, I'd say, Ashley, would you say maybe two? Just one more? All right, just one more. We promised we'd get you out of here promptly. So someone was asking, I think this is a question that I hear a lot. So let's ask, what can we explain what the My Choice Waiver Program is? And to clarify, living assisted living facilities can or cannot accept it. Yes, so I, I can will, do I that. Heard, I'm sorry, Allison. I got to tell you, the first time I met Allison is we did an ICLE webinar mm -hmm. or a seminar on demand seminar with each other um and not knowing to me allison being probably the best elder law attorney in the state of michigan um I, i'm sorry allison i i know you're modest but uh i was way out of my league but allison i'll let you get to it um i just wanted to make sure that i i i put in my two cents we did meet over the discussions about My Choice. So My Choice is one of those programs I'm talking about. It's a fantastic program where people who would otherwise have to go to a nursing home can receive those same nursing home level of care services in their own home, has a very wide range of services. Not only do they provide that personal care assistance and chore services, they can do home modifications. They can give you a, a um, one of those personal uh, medical alert um, devices so that you will be safe at home. In some of my cases, very rare, but in some of my cases, I can get 24-hour care at home for my clients. So um, as I said, that's in very rare circumstances, but it's a tremendous program. So and in answer to uh, can assisted living facilities accept my choice waiver, Yes, it is up to those facilities whether they want to participate, but my choice can give them extra reimbursement to provide additional services. So if you're someone in assisted living and they can't quite meet your needs with their usual array of services and you would otherwise have to go to a nursing home, but you really want to stay in the assisted living you're in, that's a great time to see if my choice can provide services in that assisted living facility. And then you can stay there and get the services that you need. Um. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to each and every one of you. We wish we had more time to answer more questions, but we do want to be respectful of the times of our viewers and of our panelists. We thank you so much for joining us today. And without you all even knowing it, this conversation touches me personally. And I've learned so much, if you can see here. <laughs> um, and if you have you know, any other, if you'd like to call us to do an intake or you think you might need some support and you're not sure, please do give us a call. Legal Services of Eastern Michigan at 1-800-322-4512. And we will be more than happy to support you or direct you to someone who might be even better equipped to support you, if not us. As always, we are so grateful for you sharing your beautiful digit energy with us here on the Legal Services of Eastern Michigan Legal Lounge. We hope that we can see you next time on, is that June 15th? Is it June 15th, Katie, that we'll have our conversation about Juneteenth in the history of fair housing. Very excited about this. Uh, right, super excited. Um, and thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again. Same time, same place, different panelists, same beautiful energy here on the Legal Services of Eastern Michigan Legal Lounge. Peach and peep, peep, pra, 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 pra. Would have been, oh, I almost had it. Peace, peace, had and, it. Power. <laughs> peace and power. Peace and power, Dan, take us out. <laughs>